209. In addition, the defendant admitted to the uncharged act as follows. Rape of Jane Doe number one having occurred on September 4th, 1976 in the County of Sacramento, a violation of Penal Code Section 261. Robbery of Jane Doe number one having occurred on September 4th, 1976 in the County of Sacramento, a violation of Penal Code Section 211. Is there any victim or victim's uh, family wish to speak as to count 14 or any of the uncharged acts? Yes, I would like to speak for my mother, Patricia Murphy. All right, when you are prepared, uh, you may proceed. Pretty difficult to prepare for this, but very happy. It's been a long time coming. I'd like to apologize to the survivor that was before me if you could overhear me. I didn't mean that. Today is totally completely appropriate because today is a Mon Tuesday and it's the law of karma. So this is my impact statement for my mom, Patricia Murphy. And I don't know what kind of emotions will come out, so we'll find out. Your Honor, it's been four decades plus four years since Joseph D'Angelo attacked me at my parents' house. It happened during the Labor Day weekend, September 4th, 1976. I was loading a basket full of clean laundry into my car. He came up behind me out of nowhere on that Saturday night. That night forever changed me. I was 29 years old, about the same age as D'Angelo. I was separated from my husband, learning to live on my own after a long marriage. My daughter was seven years old, and my sons 10 and 14. I had a good job with the state and was enjoying my newfound freedom and independence. But my world was different after the attack. I never felt safe for many years. It was hard for me to trust people. I was always looking over my shoulder, expecting someone to jump out at me. I wonder why he picked me to be one of his rape victims. I'll never know if he came upon me by accident or if he carefully planned out his attack beforehand. Who was he? Did he know my name? Did he know I would be at my parents' house that night? Will he follow me from now on? He punched me in the face and broke my nose. I had a concussion from falling backwards and hitting my head on the driveway. I saw stars. I lost consciousness. He shook me until it soon became clear that he and his knife had complete control over me for the next two hours. the trauma of which I am being traded for at this time. I could not escape. I did what I had to do to stay alive. He stole my car and my purse, which meant he knew my own address on my license and registration. Because of that, I moved out of my apartment so he couldn't find me and my children. I was somehow able to get on with my work and being a single mom. I went back to, with, to work with the remains of a black eye and a slightly swollen nose. The lump on my nose never went away. I learned to accept that is just part of my face. My coworkers would ask me how I got the black eye and I would just say, I was mugged. That's what we told our children too. What really happened became a dark secret that I kept buried except for telling a few close friends. Just wasn't something I wanted to think about, much less talk about. I longed for things to go back to how they were. I pretended life was fine. But it wasn't. It was exhausting. It was hard to find joy. My mind was never at peace. I turned to alcohol and drugs to help blot it all out and numb my pain. How I felt about men changed after that night. I no longer cared if I were seen as attractive. I didn't trust anymore. I am blessed to have married my husband 32 years ago. 32 years ago. 
He is on my healing journey with me. So is my family, except for my parents who have since passed away. My mom didn't want to move, so I continued to visit them there. I celebrated Christmas and other holidays at their house as if nothing ever happened. Sometimes there was no place to sit except on the organ bench. He tied me to before he drank my dad's beer and left. I was always afraid that my dad would kill someone he thought would be my, could be my attacker. He was out looking for him with other people in the east area of Sacramento. I was diagnosed with complex PTSD soon after D'Angelo's arrest in April 2018. His arrest was a total shock. It stirred up all the painful memories of the past I had learned to block out. I was with my daughter when the news scrolled on my phone. She already knew what happened to me back in 1976. But it was a complete surprise to my sons. The news and its aftermath prompted me to have a mental breakdown, and I was hospitalized 5150 for three days in June of that year. I was emotionally exhausted, unstable, and not able to deal with reality. I had trouble sleeping after I found out they caught him. I had vivid nightmares. I was prescribed different medications to deal with my anxiety and depression. I'm now getting therapy from a woman who specialized in treating this type of trauma. <clears throat> Some people are wired wrong, and D'Angelo is one of them. Luck finally ran out for this messed up human being. At least a poor excuse for one. It is my hope that you punish him to the full extent of the law for the horrific crimes he committed. He admitted that he caused all the suffering and misery to so many victims over the past 40 plus years. He truly is an evil monster with no soul. Did his little penis drive him to be so angry? all the time? Did he study criminology so he could carry out his evil deeds as a bad cop without getting caught? Did his wife and daughter suspect anything? In closing, I want D'Angelo to end up in a place he deserves. I don't want him to like his surroundings one bit. I don't buy his act that he's on his last legs. The last years of his pitiful life ought to be spent in the worst prison in existence today. I have a favor to ask though. When you hand down his sentence, please do not address him as sir anymore. Thank you, ma'am. So that's my mom's. <laughs> Does anybody else wish to be heard as to this uh, count 14? Yes, I have one for myself as Very well. Good. Thank you, ma'am. And um, I'm going to be respectful to the court. I'm going to admit that I cuss like a sailor or a trucker. I'm going to use initials. You'll know what I'm talking about. If they come out, I do apologize. I have respect for the court. I have respect for you, Honorable Judge Bowman, all of the lawyers here, all of the district attorneys, I and the defense that. attorneys as well. That. But this is your this is your moment. Yes, and also for the the defense attorneys as well. Someone has to do this job, and you're willing to do this job. Um, I really, really especially want to thank May Lynn and Ann, the victim advocates. They completely advocate for us. And these are my words. These were the words of my mom. If I talk about my mom, they're my words. 
And I want to thank old friends who've resurfaced to, to be here to support me. And I'd like to thank new friends that I've met along the way who are also supporting me. It is an honor to be here today. This day has been a very long time coming. Joe raped my mom when I was seven. It broke up our family. My brother lived with us, and then he didn't. My mom was protecting us and couldn't tell us why. We were too young to understand. All I knew is that everything changed overnight. It affected both of my brothers, father, and my whole entire family. It affected all of us. I became my mom's mom. She went from being strong and independent and free to having PTSD. Any loud noise scared her. A backfire from a motorcycle. A firework. A cabinet shutting. Any loud noise was too much to take. Nobody could ever sneak up on my mom. It was just something you knew to never ever do. Joe tried to take my mom away from me. Maybe it was Jerry. Either way, it didn't work. We are close, we are best friends, and mother-daughter, daughter-mother, we share the same name. When Joe violated her, she was Patricia Cosper. I am Patricia Cosper. I am not Jane Doe. Nor is my beautiful, sweet, strong mom, Patricia Cosper. Joe stole her car. We loved that car. It was super fast and it broke down all the time, but we loved it. He took that too. Joe took trinkets or photos. He drank beer from the fridge and ate snacks from my grandparents' pantry. That was not his intention. He intended harm and suffering. He was ruthless and cunning and patient and powerful. And now he is just locked up. Locked up for life. I would like to read the words of Jesus through Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders shall be subject to judgment. He knew better. He was treated extremely poorly as a child, abused and tormented. That is no excuse. Rot in jail, and then rot in prison. Turns out Joe, Jerry, Joe won't be gone in the dark after all. Turns out I don't have to hunt Joseph D'Angelo, Golden State Killer, East Area Rapist, Original Night Stalker, Visalia Ransacker. I don't have to hunt him down after all. Michelle McNamara did that for me. Michelle McNamara, the crime writer, didn't give up and law enforcement did not give up. She was his final victim. Sorry, <laughs> I'm almost done. All right, you take your time. I see her as a survivor because she got him caught, her spirit survived. She got him caught, she did not give up and now you rot. And you're not feeble. He's not feeble. And he's also a pedophile. Anybody who rapes, anybody who's not of age is a pedophile and a rapist and a murderer. Um, 
I'm only here because of the imprisonment, the false imprisonment, the rape of the rape of the statutes of limitations is over. So due to the fact that he tied up my mom and took her from room to room to room in my grandparents' home, the very first place I ever visited out of the hospital, the only place there was actually some happy memories of some happy family stuff going on. So I would just ask also to get him the f away from me <laughs> because um, since I've been seven, he's been around. And then working in Roseville, living in Citrus Heights, I think he should go to the worst prison. I also think he should get the away from Sacramento. I'm glad that we're here today. It is the capital. He violated the whole state. But if there's any county where he didn't do his damage, either way, it doesn't matter. He's never getting out. And um, this is my beautiful mom and my grandma and myself. And um, my grandfather was out looking for you to kill you. And let me just tell you, if my grandma got her hands on you, she would have killed you with her own bare hands. But you just keep doing your jumping jacks and your push-ups and your sit-ups and your shit, your stuff. So um, I'm going to sing a little song. It's really short. It's what my grandpa we used to sing um, when we would say goodbye to somebody. <laughs> and it goes like this. Bye-bye, Joe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Joe. Don't cry and Joseph D'Angelo and his mother can go straight to hell. This is for him, I know he can't look at me and he was blocked during this, whatever his plea thing was, but I mean this, <laughs> obviously I haven't been able to forgive yet. I think after all this, after Friday, I'll be able to forgive, but in the meanwhile, this is what I have for him. Not you, defenders, him in the orange, the subhuman. <laughs> 